guys, Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com where you can go to learn all about the double bass. We have lessons and courses to help you on your journey and we also have interviews with some of the bass world's most inspiring and exciting artists. And this gentleman is somebody who has been on the scene for a long time. He's made a huge impact uh, in, as an artist, as an educator, as a composer. He's performed with many of the legends of uh, the jazz world, including Kenny Barron, uh, Don, uh, Donald Byrd, Lee Connitz, JJ Johnson, to name a few. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to Discover Double Bass. It's Rufus Reed. Welcome, Rufus. It's just great to see you today. Well, thank you. It's really great to be able to see you in person. I, time, I know we've communicated know. online over yes, the years, yes. and uh, I, I last saw you perform in uh, at the Barbican, I think, in 2019, pre-pandemic, uh, with your um, uh, playing with a big band with one of your pieces. The, yes, uh, it was the. Uh, Quiet Pride yeah. music, uh, I, I call it the Elizabeth Catlett Project, a beautiful sc sculptor, artist, and uh, yeah, it was a real thrill to be there to have it played oh. there. Well, it was wonderful to hear you and to, as I say, to finally meet you. And, and I mean, there's so many questions to, uh, to talk to you about, but one of the things that I, um, I was wondering is, you're an influence to so many bass players, and we're going to be talking about your impact on the bass world. but when you were starting out and you were excited about music, and I know that you were a trumpet player originally, who were, who were the bass players who lit the fire for you, who you really heard and thought, wow, this is where, where I want to go? Well, you know, at that time when I really started to uh, get involved with the bass, which was an infatuation when I was in high school, uh, we had a band, of course, I was the trumpet player, and we would take a we had an accordion and saxophone and drums and bass and I played trumpet and we had shiny little jackets you know and um, and we would re rehearse whatever we did and we would take a break and then I would go over to the bass and just kind of pull the string and I just like I said how how it felt how it resonated and I in retrospect I think that's really really what got me. Uh, but I didn't really get into it. I got into the military. Uh, I was in the Air Force uh, band and I had an opportunity to have a base. I didn't own a base, but the military had a base. And the bass player, who was a tuba player, he never touched a double bass. And after we were our regular morning meetings, the rehearsal room was mine the rest of the day. So I began to just uh, pick it up and try to figure it out, you know. And uh, I had uh, Bob Haggard. Yeah. Bass book. That was the first okay. one that I actually had. I didn't know had. he did a bass book, but that yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah. And, uh, there was a picture on the corner and it said, this is E flat, you know. And, ah, I see. And I saw it, I, I said, okay. <laughs> and so, so I, I did a gig, I had an opportunity to audition and I had the audacity to audition f for a bass in a band um, and I didn't own a bass. Um, the guy had electric bass and so he says, do you, you know Misty? Oh yeah, and I said, "Well, yeah." I, I said, know E flat. I said, "What key?" He says, "Yeah, E flat." I said, "Oh, good." <laughs> so I, I I knew where to start, you know, and um, we played enough. I had been listening enough, so I knew what the bass did, but I didn't know. My ears led me to places, um, but evidently it was good enough. He hired me, and then he taught me, and then I learned, and then I then that was. I was on my way then. So to answer your question, I've been listening, I was listening to obviously uh, my very first record that my brother had given me when I was 15 was Walking, Miles, Miles Davis, Davis Walking, and that was Percy Heath. So I actually, I guess he was really the first one that I actually knew a name, you know, and uh, it's amazing that I got a chance to even meet him and call a friend and, oh, wow. you know, and play his bass. And um, I love that album, uh, Space. Oh man, <laughs> I mean, he, he he had such a 
uh, eloquent way of playing the bass. That's you know? a great word. Uh, but he, uh, <clears throat> so that was the first one. And then, of course, Paul Chambers, you know, uh, a lot of the records. And then I, I was playing electric bass too, so I was listening to some of the James Jamerson, you know, yeah. uh, from Detroit, but I didn't even know what that was. Um, then I got a chance to go to Japan, and I, I had this record. It's called The End Sound with Eddie Harris. So yeah. Ron Carter was on it. And I said, oh, man, Billy okay. Higgins. And, and, um, and then, of course, uh, uh, Ray Brown and Oscar Peterson Trio. And I also loved the three sounds. Andy Simpkins was playing. Yeah, he played bass. Uh, and so, but in Japan, I actually saw Ray live. Oh. Uh, in Japan, we, we're talking like 1964, maybe. Um, and every week there was something happening, big, huge concerts. And I went and I saw Ray Brown and I said, that's what I want to do. Now, I didn't have a clue as to how mm -hmm. difficult it was to be able to do that. Uh, he was having so much fun and the bass, the bullets was just coming out of the bass. It was just uh, amazing. Um, so for me, uh, then I saw Duke Ellington's band there. Um, wow. <laughs> and, and then I, I saw the Modern Jazz Quartet with Percy, Percy but I actually m met him then, you know. Wow. And uh, Did you tell him that you'd been uh, listening to him? I can't even remember <laughs> what I, I'm, I probably was speechless, yeah. you know. Um, but it was, it was uh, that time in Japan, uh, because the, they loved the music so much, the Japanese people, and the, they produce so much music. Uh, and so I heard a great deal of people, and that just kind of solidified even more my convictions to, to, so when I got out, my first thing was to go back to school because I was 17 when I joined because my mother had to sign for me because, you, you know, I wasn't 18 yet. So after that, I knew, I said, I need a teacher. So I got a, so there were like four or five major colleges and universities, but each one had a notable bass teacher. And I ended up going to uh, Northwestern University where uh, Joseph Guastafeste was the principal of Chicago Symphony and uh, Warren Benfield was the faculty at Northwestern. Wow. So when I got there, it was amazing to have, uh, I got involved with the Civic Orchestra in Chicago. And going to a quote unquote orchestra was another animal for me. I mean, I had no, everything was late. Everything was, I would call it ass backwards. Every, you know, yeah. how I learned was just not the way, um, when I got into Northwestern, uh, I had to really pump up, uh, two years to just to graduate, you know, my senior recital and all that. Um, but I had the bass in my hands, all, and then I would play, and then I got a chance to play locally for people, Joe Siegel in the Jazz Showcase in Chicago. And then I would go to the south side of Chicago. So the bass was in my hand at least 17, 18 hours a day. Wow. Uh, and so, that's that's how you play that you know but uh percy was probably the first and then, then uh, because of such a an array of recordings uh paul chambers was really uh you know hot did you ever time. see him perform i never got to see him perform oh, live at yeah. all and i uh, just was before my time there sure. unfortunately he he got away too early in his yeah. life, and sure. uh, uh, and then live. Once I moved, I moved to Seattle, and I saw. That's when I saw uh, George Mraz. That's when I saw uh, uh, 
Steve Swallow. Oh, wow. When he was still playing the double bass. I, I, it's interesting. I posted a video of Steve Swallow playing at Bright Bass. Yes, I think and he was with Stan Getz. Yes, maybe. yes, I, was, yes. I didn't know that he played. Well, he did, uh, did some things with uh, Jimmy Jufri. Oh, wow. You know, and... Uh, but then I then I saw Andy Simpkins with uh, Three Sounds. They would come. And then I saw uh, Cecil McBee with... Uh, Charles Lloyd. Mm. It's a very famous album, and it was it was Keith Jarrett was playing the piano, and Jack DeJohnette was playing the drums, and in the in the middle of the set, Jack got up, Keith got up, and they switched. Oh wow! Yeah. And the set continued, and I said, "You can do that." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know people could even do that. I, I was just trying to, and I'm still just trying to play these four strings, much less another instrument. So that was thrilling. Uh, did you ever meet Gary Peacock? Yes, I did, actually. That would have been a cool bass hang. <laughs> yes, well, Gary, when he came to Seattle, he left New York, and he got a job at a luthier's shop. Um, had he stayed in New York, we may not have heard him because he was, you know, uh, he was trying to clean up, okay. clean up his life, and he did, of course. And but I met him. I actually bought a bass from him. Wow! You know, um, and I used to love going into the shop because it was just standing around watching them people work on basses and stuff. Um, and he got hired there. Um, and for a few years. Which shop know. was it, Rufus? Do you uh, remember? I think the the owner's name was Julian Clark. Okay, so I think that was the name wow. of the shop. You have some very special places in the bass world that are in New York, of course, with David Gage and the Coldstein shop as well. I mean, yeah. yes. Well, Julian Clark, I think that was his name, and it was, uh, you know, in Seattle at that time. We're talking about now of '68. There are some great musicians in that city, even to this day. You know, it's a beautiful place, and it was really uh, good for me. And uh, um, my brother lived there, and so he kind of allowed me to come and kind of get my act together after being in the military. You know, sure. and uh, so my main thing was just to get a teacher. And so uh, James Harnett. It was the principal base of the Seattle Symphony at that time. And Did he I, teach you French bow? And well, he asked me, I, and I had a bass and a, and a bow, and, but I didn't know anything. And so he said, uh, do you have a bow? And I went and pulled it out, and, and it was a German bow. He said, ah. I don't teach German bow. <laughs> I said, okay, I didn't know the difference. I didn't know, the, you know, sure. I'm still learning, you know. <laughs> so. Um, so I said, okay, I'll get a French bow, and I found and got one pretty cheap, and so that's how, and he prepared me to play well enough to pass an audition to go to Northwestern, you know. Wow. But it was really, uh, if, well, first of all, he says, I don't teach jazz people. I said, oh. So I, I kept being a, uh, a nuisance, and I kept calling him up. And then eventually, he said, okay. I can see in his mind, he was saying, let me, let me get this young guy and get him out of my hair. You know? <laughs> so I went to him, he gave me a, he says, I need you to work on this, and this, and this, and, and get this book, and you work on this, and, and uh, come back next week. I'm sure he didn't think he would see me again, you know, but I did exactly what, at least as I tried to do as, as much as I possibly could. And, and I hacked my way through it, but I think he got the message that I was serious. And um, he played like Gary Carr, you okay. know. I didn't really know, I never saw anybody play like that before. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know. You know, it was a part of the world I didn't know about, you know. But he was, uh, uh, got me started, and then when I got to Northwestern, it just started to go. Uh, 
Joe Guastafesti was uh, fantastic. Uh, he was more of a technician, little hammers. Yeah. You know, and w both he and Warren Benfield were great bases, but Warren talked more about the phrasing. And, okay, and the jazz, and, the... Well, no, well, not at all. None of them knew anything about jazz. Oh, I see. I didn't want them to. Yeah. I wanted them to teach me how to get a sound out of the bass. And to me, I think that is probably the best thing that I could have ever done to help me uh, do what I do because it helped strengthen my left hand and uh, my pizzicato. And they were always amazed at the pizzicato that I was doing. Um, but I think that's why my book, you know, I, I actually, uh, my book, The Evolving Basses, I, I actually mentioned the bows. You know, a jazz bass player wasn't going to uh, pick up a book. I mean, I had all the ballet and the nanny and the... Samando. Samando, <laughs> of course, and uh, uh, all, every, I bought every book that was on the market, but there was, I think Ron Carter had just put out a, a, a small book, and Richard Davis even had a very, a very small, but to me they were like chapters sure. of, a, of a book, and so, um, and I, this is part of the instrument. Yeah. And so I, I wanted to be able to introduce it to the quote unquote aspiring jazz musician that it will help you be better. You know? we, were you using it, the bow, in your improvising when you were at the, you know, I think about your, your work with um, Dexter Gordon and, you know, this kind of time where you were really, you know, uh, making a, f a huge impact in the bass world, perhaps in the build-up towards the evolving basses. Did, were you improvising with the bow or was it more of a I, practice tool? Well, I, I was doing it, uh, I call, I would become foolish and take the bow solo, um, but I, I, I do have some recordings. I never really played it a lot. Yeah. But uh, there's some recordings that I, I would play the bass. I did something, I think, something I did live with Tommy Flanagan in, in Italy, and I forgot it. And I said, oh, I took a bow solo on that, ooh. Um, and then I did something with Hank Jones, uh, where I took a bow solo on that, and Lovely. with uh, Gene Bertoncini, I did something with that. But I wasn't, uh, I wasn't really known, you know, as, uh, and I wasn't trying to play like Paul Chambers sure. or anything, because that's what everybody was trying to, trying to do. But it was something that I aspired to do, and I would do it, and sometimes I would surprise myself. And, um, and then when I started changing strings, um, and some of the strings were not as friendly to the bow, um, <laughs> um, but there was always the excuse, you know, with Jimmy Blanton playing like he played with gut strings. And Paul and Chambers. Still, and yeah, and Paul didn't hold those too, back. So, so they didn't hold back, so yeah. I said, well. But um, I can use the bow, but I've never lived trying to actually work out some things mm. with the bow. Yeah, it was always pretty spontaneous when I did. So the evolving bassist really um, is it's the it's the industry standard jazz bass method, but every you know jazz bass player that I know or that you know probably has has this book and has worked through it at times. How do you feel reflecting on your contribution to the education of, of bass players? Well, I mean, it's, it's very influence. interesting to me that I that is still alive. Oh, it's. But <laughs> the thing is, I didn't. Purposely, I didn't stylize it. And I think that's one of the reasons why it has whatever long, longevity. Long, longevity yeah. Because um, I remember there was this fantastic book, of, what was her name? Um, uh, she was a recording. Carol Kay? Carol Kay, yeah. yes. You know, she had great books, and it was yeah. about the things that she had just recorded with Stevie Wonder or whatever. Yeah. And, and, but by the time the book came out, 
the style had changed and she had changed up. They were great for reading and trying to get that stuff together. But I didn't want, uh, I talk about walking bass lines, but you can walk country and western, you can walk uh, just pop music, you can just, yeah. I mean, so I tr a chord is a chord, n <laughs> no matter what genre you're playing in it. And, Understanding the, uh, being friendly with the piano. That's and, a lovely phrase. You know, I, I absolutely took a lot from that when I was. Uh, well, to me, see, nobody told me. I just met a young bass player last week, 15 years old, and he was playing really good. <laughs> and I never started until 18, but nobody told me that the piano is the orchestra and 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 it, it and helped me do what i do better if i understand harmony and so uh, uh, that was very apparent that a lot of people uh, didn't think about it because they were a bass player you know and and i thought that way too if you're a trumpet player you play trumpet you play violin you play violin um, um, but the piano, uh, if you get a little friendly, I said, listen, I'm not a pianist at all, but I'm friendly with the piano, and it's really helped me, particularly with my compositions and things of that nature. But uh, uh, just learning to play a chromatic scale, and you play it on, what does it sound like? You know, uh, it's not just one finger, two fingers. You have to really hear, hear it. So uh, I'm really happy about that. But I think the major aspect was that I didn't stylize it to the point where uh, I, I have pictures of, my, of myself playing and I even transcribe some of my own solos, you know, as opposed to uh, uh, people transcribing, because everybody's transcribing everybody now, it seems. Did you arrange know, some duets as well on that? I seem there's to some duets uh, of some of my compositions. Yeah. I just made, At the end, uh, yeah. made up some things. Uh, uh, because I think two basses playing together is really fun. Well, you, you did know. that album with uh, Peter End. Uh, with Peter End, yes. We did, um, we did a uh, video. Of, of oh, I've not seen that. And, and uh, yeah. Uh, the 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 recording is basically that music too, yeah. you know. Um, and then I also did a two bass uh, double with Michael Moore. The intimacy of the bass and double da double bass delights. Oh. and and the bass player who owns this bass, his name was Ned Mann. Okay. Who unfortunately died with ALS. Uh, you know okay, the. Yeah. Uh, and I helped him pick this instrument out. He was a great, Ned man. Mm. He was playing with Michelle Camilo and a oh. lot of different, so that's how well yeah. he played. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, Charlie Mingus had ALS, and okay. you know, that's how he died. I didn't and, know uh, that. Uh, uh, um, uh, what do they call it? Lou Gehrig's disease, they mm. call that. But it attacks your spirit your brain and then you lose all your muscles and oh. stuff and then you don't live very long but his was different Ned's was, it attacked his spine and so he lived seven years longer than people you know even expected but he was a, a recording engineer as well as a great bass player and he had it in his home so Michael Moore, now he was the bass, Michael was the last bass player with Dave Brubeck, you know, so, uh, but he and I, we even played some gigs at two basses. Really, know? I would like to have seen and, that. Oh, yeah, and it was a lot of fun working out, you know, uh, he played, we're about the same age, uh, but he, he, I kind of live more down here and he soloed really well in the upper register. So we, it was almost automatic uh, you know, difference in the, yeah. for the clarity of the bass. Because it can sound like some elephants fighting, you know, <laughs> if, you, you know if you're all in the same range. So uh, 
I wanted to be able to put things like that in that book, you know, and then of course in the back just a list of recordings that everyone should just listen to. And that is what's missing today for me uh, is that the students don't listen, at least like I, we have these uh, uh, iPhones and you have a thousand, but nobody really listens to it. And, and the, the students of today, they listen to, they got the TV on, they're doing their homework, and then they're yeah. messing with the phone. We didn't have any of those distractions. Yeah. Um, and it's not to say that obviously we have some magnificent young players coming up, you know. Uh, of course. But uh, just the act of listening. We used to get together and, and we would, a group, and we would listen to the new Miles Davis record or the new Chick Career album that just came out or whatever, and we would just cut the lights down and turn the volume up and we wouldn't talk and we would just listen. And then we would rehearse with that inspiration, you know. Um, I don't think a lot of that is going on like that these days. And uh, the individuals are great. I mean, I've heard some unbelievable uh, technical playing, but uh, I might have to go somewhere else to actually get enriched and become warm. When I used to go down and listen to Sam Jones play. Wow. And you just smile for the rest of the evening. Yeah. You're, you're just warm. You know? <laughs> I don't know how to, how to discuss it. That's what's so wonderful about certain players that you, you can you dazzle you. You say, oh, and, and it's amazing. But there are other players, um, like Ray Brown. I mean, he was just having, and the sound and the clarity coming out of the bass. Uh, that's, that's what... I was going to ask you what your um, message would be to students of the evolving bassist, and maybe it sounds like you've just shared that already, really. So it's really about listening. But I was wondering if there's anything else that comes to mind with that question. Well, I think you that met, listening so. to other people play yeah. and then recordings, and then really listening to you, listening what's really, what are you producing? Um, so I've added that a little bit of, of, of I want the students to be, be a little more responsible uh, of what actually you're playing. Um, and if you really like it, you learn to love it, and then I might too, you know. Because if you don't like the way you play, why should I? Yeah. Why should the listener, if you're not... So you should project, and as far as I'm concerned, the bass players have the unique ability to sabotage every band we play in, <laughs> you know. Um, and so we have a lot of power and responsibility to make it jump. Um, I think when I played with Stan Getz, with Kenny Barron and Victor Lewis, it was like, my job is to pl play with Victor the best I can and he with me, and then Kenny Barron has no choice. Then we have the trio, and then Stan. We're there to make him sound better than it, anybody else would. And that's why he's come to you, because he just loves that sound. And Rufus, this is bringing me to a story in my mind, which I'm quite worried might not be true, uh, but I've heard this about you. And it's, it, could you speak a little bit about how you got your gig with J.J. Johnson? Because <laughs> I think this is great that he is, you, he's drawn to your sound and it feels like it, it marries up in this conversation well. Well, yes, I, I, you know, I've been playing and teaching for years in the summertime with Jamie Abelsold. Another person who's hugely contributed to the, uh, I mean, in Amazing. a profound way. You know, sure. I'm on volume one. <laughs> right, okay. So he's got over 100 volumes now, you know. Wow. But... Um, so you were working with Jamie Abelsold? So I, 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 every summer, you know, I would try, not every year, but I did it for almost 45 years, well, you know. You did your and, chat. You know, um, <laughs> And so when J.J. Johnson came back, because he left uh, the playing scene and went to L.A. to re 
to uh, compose and write for films and television. And so, uh, and he would practice. And so when he came back, when the things got a little, uh, weren't as busy anymore, his wife said, we should go back to Indianapolis, that was where he's from. And so his career almost like jump-started again, you know, and uh, so his manager says, uh, I've got the piano player and I've got the drummer. And he said, well, I, I have this bass player I practice with every day. Um, uh, I don't, let, let me go look, and he had to go look, you know, I had been playing with Dexter and everything, but J.J. didn't hear me at all. So he says, uh, his name is uh, Ru Rufus Reed. And the manager says, I know him. And uh, I'll, yeah, that's what I want. If I, I, I want someone who plays like this guy. And then, and then there, that was my name, and that's how I got the gig. So I, uh, <laughs> I'm so glad so, that's true, because yeah, I heard that, and I was thinking it yeah, just it, sounds It so. is very true, uh, and I was with J.J. Uh, on, and off, on and off for about nine years. You know, there was about wow. three years in the middle when his wife had a stroke and subsequently had passed. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, yeah, that's how I got that gig, because I always tell the students, you never know who's listening to you. Oh, that is a beautiful, You never beautiful know. Message. So the thing is, sometimes people save it for the concert stage, but you shouldn't save it ever. If you start to play and you're playing with people, you only play, you play, you give it all, whatever it is. Well, you've yeah. shared so much with us, and, and one of the things we were chatting about beforehand is your association with the ISB and furthering uh, not just music education, but the the d position of the double w the, the double bass uh, in the you know the wider community. And I just wonder if you could speak perhaps a little bit about the ISB because it's such an important organisation for us, and perhaps m some of the viewers may not be aware of what its work. Oh well, Gary Carr was the founder of. of of the ISB. Oh, the International Society of Basis, I've not said it. <laughs> Co correct. Yeah. Um, and of course, it was strictly at that time uh, primarily the classical bassist that played and who aspired to play like Gary. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, at the early stages, uh, business wise, it got a little shaky. And then eventually, uh, uh, I remember, uh, I think, Jeff Bradetich, who's a marvelous teacher and player uh, in Texas now, in North Texas, uh, began to not let it dwindle. So, uh, so and then eventually, uh, everybody who was associated said, well, well, we can't let the organization just kind of dwindle mm -hmm. away. So we need we need we need some uh, a person or a an organization to help us, you know, um, put it together. So we some people were reticent about it, and eventually we we found this extraordinary uh, woman that had the company, uh, Madeline Crouch, and the moment we. Uh, were able to acquire her and her her office. Uh, everything came together. You know, the monies was done correctly. All the um, and all of a sudden things began to get a little bit better. Then the magical thing for me. Well, I had met Richard Davis when I was in. Uh, still living in Chicago, and I was playing with Eddie Harris in, in New York, and I ran across Richard, and he was doing a concert at, I guess, Alice Tully Hall. I, I don't remember. It was a long time ago. And he says, you, you, it was just happen chance. My wife and I were having breakfast, and he was having before the rehearsal. He says, you, you want to come to the rehearsal? And so he brought us in, and great, and after the rehearsal with the orchestra, I said, 
He says, okay, uh, you want to come to the concert tonight? It's 8 o'clock. I said, well, yeah, we're all, we were off. He says, I have to go now, and I'm going down to do a recording session, you know. And so uh, I said, okay. So we, he did that. We messed around New York, and then we went to the concert that night. And at 10 o'clock, he says, okay, I'll see you later. I have to go down to the village, and I'm playing, you know, uh, and I told my wife, I said, that's what I want to do. He played, <laughs> he, he played with the orchestra, and then he did a commercial recording, and then he played the concert, and then he went down. And so uh, uh, it was amazing, but he and Gary Carr used to do duets and stuff wow. together. I think there's some but YouTube There are some YouTube in. videos, yeah. And uh, I met Richard and I ended up being the bassist in the Dad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra. He was the initial bass player, and then George Moraz. There were several different people, but main players. So I, uh, and so the organization started to, every year it got a little better. Every, you know, uh, had conferences every two years. And then the idea of having this one conference in Cincinnati when they embraced the classical basses and the jazz basses and it was the very first time and they had the luthiers uh, who were the you know the Samuel Colsteins and the Dave uh, uh, Traeger Chuck Traeger yeah his and book so, and, uh, and um, so they were all there because they would repair Charlie Mingus's bass or or um, oh, with no blinds yeah. bass, it wouldn't matter. Yeah, I guess. right, exactly. So um, <clears throat> they were all there, and Milt Hinton was there, Ray Brown was there, Eddie Gomez was there, oh. um, and then uh, Edgar Meyer and John Feeney were the competitors for the classical uh, competition and the jazz competition. It was John Clayton. I, I don't even remember who else, but John won. And Edgar Meyer and John Feeney tied, which was an amazing thing. Uh, John Feeney was playing, uh, uh, what was it, a pear-shaped bass. Okay. And it was uh, David Walter's bass. That was one of his teachers. Wow. At David. So it was, I mean, it was like, and it had never happened before to have all these people coming in. And the story that I want to tell is like uh, Milt Hinton was in his prime at that time. He was probably in his uh, 60s, maybe 50s. I don't even remember. So uh, all these other classical bass was, uh, there were about probably four or 500 people coming to the, you know, register. And it's in these magnificent concerts in the evening. Uh, playing the bass, and it was like, oh, wow. And everybody would, you know, and they were, everybody's really polite. And then Milt Hinton got up on the bandstand. Of course, nobody knew who the hell he was at the time, you know, particularly the Glasgow people didn't have a clue. And he got up there and he performed. He sang, he slapped, yeah. and he was all over the bay, and it was, the pitch was just like, and uh, he would make a, he, a song, and he, he would sing about it. He says, well, you know, I have shoes older than you, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but he entertained them. He sang, and he played, and at the end of the concert, everybody stood up and yelled and screamed. I mean, it was standing ovation. It was the same group that was doing this for the classical players, but they just lost it because they had never heard anybody play the bass like that before. And to me, that was the catalyst for the the organization just has continued to do this yeah. and grow and grow and grow. Um, they just honored Edgar Meyer, you know, a merit award, and I had been involved in... Uh, Every time I would go, I would have to go home and practice. I was so inspired. 
And now I hear some of these these young uh, Xavier Foley, the young Wonderful. kid. Wonderful. Oh my yeah. goodness! You know, I mean, he, uh, uh, Nina. I uh, see her. Yeah, she yeah. just got a position now at yeah. Peabody. You know, but I met her when she was like this. Really? Yeah. Wow. So she was. Um, so it's been very exciting to just watch, and then I have to. Now I think we who have a, the m mere fact that you want me to be here, that means there's a, there are some expectations. So I got to keep practicing. I'm not done yet, <laughs> you know, but it's very inspirational. So the ISB has always been that way. Unfortunately, the last couple of years, uh, you know, uh, they were virtual things and and I tried to go to as many as possible, but I encourage everybody to go. Uh, if you really love the instrument, I think you, you had mentioned uh, Ithaca. Ithaca, yeah. There's, what, 1,500 bass players Something from like that. all over it the world. It was unbelievable, it was life-changing. Oh, man. I think it's fair to say that. And yeah, it was, it was amazing, and I think, um, yeah. The board of directors are all bass players, and everybody's just trying to just keep it afloat. And, yeah. And, and well, it's alive. all these wonderful people like that, are, that have involved Jeff Baditich. I mean, Nicholas Walker was the president at that time, and I thought he right. just did an incredible job. And, and uh, Gayla McCormack, I think, is the current president. And there's all of these exciting people. And uh, yeah, so definitely would encourage people to learn more about the ISB and. Uh, and all their wonderful work. Um, Rufus, just moving on a little bit, because there's somebody else in the room with us today. <laughs> I'm kind of, my eye is drawn to this stunning bass. Tell us a little bit about your instrument, because I'm sure our bass playing friends will want to know and maybe hear a few lo of these beautiful low notes and what's well, happening. Well, this instrument is a, you know this book, the uh, looking at the double bass, it's a small, Yeah. there's a small paragraph. It's um, Raymond something or I forget. I've, yeah, yeah, but sure. But the, the, uh, the guy who made this bass, mm. and it's been subs, um, had, uh, you know, um, uh, Joseph Rieger, uh, 1805. Wonderful German bass. And he, there's this, like a yeah. ebony arrow. I wonder arrow. if we're going to get this on yeah. the camera here, yeah. actually. Uh, maybe is, it is a German bass. It's just it a is a mitten ball. Yeah. yeah. That's unbelievable. So I've on, never seen that on any instrument. On this uh, and on the other side. And oh. right here, there's a little eye. You might see it cl but clear on just here, Ash, actually. Yeah. This was this beautiful purpling there. And th I'm told that this was uh, one of his signatures of that, of his. Uh, yeah. and, uh, this was a, uh, something that he thought was really good. And if you under look at it, you know, it's kind of a hybrid bass because this is like almost seven eighths. Mm. And everybody, so. when they see the Busetto, they think this is like a Prescott or something, yes. you know. And I said, no, it's before that, you <laughs> know. But then this, uh, and the back. Oh, let's see the back. Is, is, uh, Rufus, would you mind turning it the other way so we can have a look at the camera? Just there, because they'll get a clear view. I'll help with just holding it. Yeah. Is, this, is there an ebony strip down the back or something? Yeah, like that? I have no idea, but I think those dowels they put in. Oh, I see. Somebody had used screws wow. at one point, and then Such they a beautiful. And then they uh, put the dowels in there to put it together. And if you don't mind, tell us a bit about this beautiful um, travel neck work that you've had done, because this is a serious base to have. This adjustment. Yeah, well, everybody thought I was a little uh, <laughs> crazy to, to do this. Yeah. Uh, this is, um, I, I had gone to, uh, again, the ISB. Yes. And uh, I had been talking to Mario Lamar, who's a luthier in, in Montreal, Canada. And... Uh, I think Mark Dresser was probably the first American to have his base transformed. Is that right? By, by, uh, so I called Mark, uh, and we talked a lot about it because, you know, I, I had to think, too, I had to wrap it around my head. Was I going to do this, you know? And uh, so then when I got to... Uh, uh, 
I think it was Oklahoma. Mark was there, and he had his base in the trunk. And uh, the square trunk, you know, it was with the neck off. And when he, everybody was gathering around because this was this no one had ever seen one of these detachable bases yeah. before. I can Live imagine. I can imagine. And but so he, <laughs> it was a funny story. Uh, he takes it and he puts it on the table, and he turns it. He was holding it like this, and you heard. Clunk. And everybody said, oh, oh, that sounded like a sound post, you know. <laughs> so uh, he opened it up, and the sound post had fallen. The original thing was they would put these belts with Velcro over and tighten it. To try and keep the to pressure To keep on. the pressure once they took the mm. base off. And so uh, I had already told... Um, Mario that I, I had set up, I wanted to do this. So I immediately called him. I said, listen, I know how to put a sound post in, but I don't want to do it every day. You know, I'm traveling a lot. He said, no, I figured it out. I said, really? Uh, so if you look very closely, there's a pin. Oh, yeah, I can see on the top. But it's also... Ah, yeah, yeah, I can it's, see it there on the right back as well. But you have to really look. Oh, I didn't notice that before. And, and the thing is, so when I take it out, I could take it off right now, and mm. and, and, and it, uh, the, the sound moving. post is fine. And a lot of people can't wrap their heads around that because now they have the... Uh, oh, the adjustable The ones. adjustable... Uh, I, I forget what they're German called. guy. Yes, in, I met him uh, once at a convention, a lovely guy, and, and apparently they... Something Nova. Oh yeah. gosh, I forgot the uh, name. But Ron we'll Carter's using one. And, uh, I'll put a link below the video so people can find yeah, out. Yeah, and uh, uh, Mario had mentioned to me at one point about it, and I said, "Well, I'm, if it's, if it's, this ceases to work, then yeah, uh, I might think about that because it is a, a little expensive." But uh, uh, at any rate. Uh, so I said, okay. And 15 years later, 16 years later, that I've been using and going. So I had my first trip um, to Italy. We had six one-nighters. So I said, well, this is going to be the true test. <laughs> yeah. So I took it apart every day and put it back. You know, I can take it apart in a couple of hours, I mean, uh, uh, 15 minutes, actually. Yeah, yeah. And then... Put it, it's put it together, but it takes you know a couple hours for the strings to Settle. like putting on new strings all the time. But this one is special because I, you notice I don't have any adjusters. Oh yeah, yeah, I did actually. Well, I hadn't. Sorry, but yeah, I see. So I can turn this, and the whole the whole neck oh, will I, move up. Oh, yeah, you down. can actually see if if uh, you don't mind just turning it like this way. There's there's actually a gap there, so presumably the neck can move in that direction. Right. And in this time, just subtly. Right. Well, he's wow. got he's got the the hole for the screw, but there's also another hole there. There's a little nipple on this, or you know, uh, that won't allow the neck to move, but it will allow this movement so uh, so clever Mario is a real artist isn't he in, with his and work and it's patented and everyone else there are a couple of other people you know in France and uh, uh, what's his name Jean Array and yes yeah. he's got one and of course David Gage can do it now and yeah. it, but it's fixed yeah you know it's it's really fixed but this as you know the humidity can change and so the wood and breeze moves in and out and uh, uh, so if it's a little tight, I can uh, just adjust it. But um, uh, people told me, said, man, you're going to do that to that bass? <laughs> you know, that's an incredible bass, man. You know? mm. And then, uh, but this isn't the original neck. Okay. So Diana Gannett. Oh, yes. The most marvelous bassist. She said, Rufus. That's not the original neck, so what difference does it make? Yeah. 
I said, duh, <laughs> yeah, right. So I went ahead and did it. And uh, I have been very happy with it. Like I say, I've, I haven't had one ounce of problem. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, traveling. And, oh, and when I took this bass to, for Mario to uh, do the work, it was, you know, it was sounding pretty good, but when I picked it up, it was even better. I couldn't believe it. Rufus, I I'd be remiss if I did ask you just to play a couple of low notes, I need to, or any notes. I just need to hit this beautiful bass. So the, the the extension, you can still hear the fundamental it's with this beautiful. instrument. Any every bass, well, you can put an extension on it, but sometimes they can't handle the. But I really. It's so nice to hear you playing the notes in between and just coaxing out those. Yeah. That C is just glorious. <laughs> Well, it has been an absolute joy to, uh, uh, to meet you in person today. You actually contributed to a video that we did where people were talking about uh, it's called Le Jazz Legends series and, and you were talking about the equipment on your bass. So we'll provide a link to that so people can learn more about your uh, strings and stuff. Well, this is a new... Oh, the Nadine, is a it? A new Nadine. I've, I've, it's, I've only had it a couple months now. Oh, and okay. uh, So it's... Uh, Proves to be pretty nice, and I have the DPA microphone too. That sure. Um, but the I'm, the strings, these are the velvet animas. Yeah. But you can't get them anymore. I know. And so I had saved some uh, the low, and I. These are the uh, Ava Parazzi's. I tried to get. Uh, some larger strings. Yeah. The, the perpetuals are really nice, and, but the G string is just too, mm. too small for me. Yeah. I mean, the sound is it's clear, but I need a thicker sound. And I really enjoyed the tension. Uh, this is probably not the best uh, balance, uh, but it, so far it's not so bad. That sounds but, beautiful in your hands. But. Uh, with the uh, animas, uh, the velvet string up on the G string, it was like, it was huge. The sound was huge. And so I missed that. Yeah. And I'm getting. But uh, it was. It's just a broader sound, you know. Yeah. They're a very um, unique set, aren't they, the Velvets? They're different to everything else. Yeah, so. and I'm, uh, I had been playing them for over 20 years. Oh, and, what a drag that they've... Yeah, well, for some reason, um, uh, Stefan Schertler decided not to do them, but I do know for a fact that um, 
he's a genius guy because he makes. Uh, he was a bass player himself, you know. Ah, is that why he's done so much uh, back oh, in the? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, he played bass kind of like uh, uh, Charlie Hayden oh. kind of player. Oh. Really beautiful sound, and everything. and he made the pickups because he didn't like any of the pickups that were on the market. So anyway, uh, but it, uh, he makes microphones. I mean, he uh, for guitars and everything, but he makes the machine. That makes the string. Ah, yeah. <laughs> and it, and it, if it breaks down, he's the only one who knows how to fix it, you know. And I, I think that was one of the reasons. Um, uh, and I don't think you know the strings weren't flying off the shelf either, you know. But uh, so I, I told him, I said, to, well, well, you know, like, Tomastic and Carrasco, you know, they. They, f they have it fixed and, you know, they, they have a... He says, but if, if it's fixed, I can't change it. So he's a real inventor. Yeah. You know, he was one, that mindset. It was really something to be around him. I miss those strings, so I'm in the search. But so far, this, I think this combination is going to work for me for a while. Well, it's definitely working for the listeners. And <laughs> I just want to thank you on behalf of everyone in the bass world for... Just, you know, your incredible contribution so far, and it's great to hear that you're still out there working, composing, sharing new music. What, what do you have in the pipeline, just to finish off, Rufus? Is there anything well, you... actually, uh, thank you for asking. I, I've got a, a pre-pandemic, I, I did a vinyl with my trio with a string quartet on Nouvelle Records. Oh, beautiful. Um, but after so many uh, uh, years of the release, the audio reverted back to me. So I recorded this past January um, two more tunes with the trio and the string quartet, and it was uh, the quartet is called the Serious Quartet. The, uh, they really uh, amazing. So I have uh, a new CD that's coming out uh, with uh, six pieces with the string quartet and the trio and the rest of the trio uh, on Sunnyside in, in late November. Um, so I'm excited about that and it's going to be called Celebration. Oh. And um, so you'll be hearing more about it, but that's, uh, I'm really excited about being able to get that music because the vinyl went out primarily to, you know, audiophile people who really, and it really got out there really well, but there's a lot of people who have never heard this, so uh, I'm excited about getting that out. Well, as someone who doesn't own a record player, I'm excited too, because <laughs> I've got your perpetual stroll on CD, I think, Ooh, and yeah, uh, wow. you know, some, there's so many of your beautiful records, and we'll provide links below this video so everyone can learn more about uh, your recorded work. And of course, everybody already knows about the evolving basis, but for those who don't, go and get a copy of that. And uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, on behalf of everybody here and in the wider bass world, thank you, Rupert. It's been a real pleasure today, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to see you again, Jeff. And, and uh, it's my pleasure. And to me, uh, bass is it. You know, <laughs> you know. What a beautiful way to end. Yeah.